Here we will talk about estimating and using vector autoregressive models. Let's first state uh, a var p model. Now p is generic so we are just using the lag polynomial here uh, phi l, big phi l. We also know that we can represent the same model as a vector moving average model and that's achieved by pre-multiplying both sides with the inverse of that lag polynomial. Depending on what we want to do, we are using different representations. So when we're talking about the estimation of the model, what we will use is the vector autoregressive representation. So let us state a var1 model. For simplicity, var1, but this will generalize. And we are using a dimension of k equals 2, so two variables. So here's our var1 model. We have one lag of the yt's and the error terms. Now we can write this down as individual equations. So the equation for the first element is going to be y1t equals to alpha 1 then times these dynamics and then the same for y2t. Uh, we're just out multiplying out all these matrices. So we have these two individual models which together represent our var1 model. Let's call them a and b and turns out that a and b can be estimated by OLS if the process is stationary and, we'll, and you will know about stationarity conditions. One question that arises is how do I know that a var1, so the lag order of 1, is appropriate? There are basically two ways to go about that. You could either check for the autocorrelation in the residuals. Okay, What you want is that the residual vector is uncorrelated. If there is autocorrelation, then we increase the lag order. Alternatively, or in addition to that, you could also look at the information criterion. These information criteria formalize a trade-off between the number of parameters and the fit of the model and what we want to do is we want to find that value of p that delivers the smallest value for the information criteria. So once you have estimated parameters what can we do with a VAR model? And VARs are used mostly used for one or two one of two purposes either for forecasting or we want to interpret the relationships between the variables and what we use here are impulse, what are called impulse response functions. We shall start out with forecasting. It's a little easier to start out with. So here again we have a var p model and so in a vector form, the var form and once you estimate parameters what you get you get hats for these coefficients and a hat for yt and then of course we need to remove the um, error term so let's say we use observations for t from 1 to capital t to estimate these parameters and now what we want to do is we want to form an expectation about the value for y at time t capital t plus 1 using information at time capital t oh i forgot a hat over the alpha now this conditional expectation is very easy. It's just the conditional mean part and we are using the estimated coefficient vectors. Okay, and the expected value of the error term is zero so there's no error term appearing here and that is what we call our prediction of y hat at time t plus one. Okay, that's in just basically like in any linear regression model. Recall that if y is a 2 by 1 vector, that is a 2 by 1 vector as well, that forecast. So let's go to a two-step ahead forecast, meaning we want the expected value of y capital T plus 2, still only using information at time capital T. So what we now do is we need to think about what's one period lag for T plus 2, that's T plus 1, two period lags capital T and P period lag is capital T minus P plus 2. Now that Y T plus 1 we don't have, but we have an estimate for capital T plus 1. So that's what we use in here. It means we have everything and what we get is Y hat capital T plus 2. And you can spin that forward to more 
periods ahead. So let's think about the properties of our forecasts and we'll think about forecast errors. So let's define Fe t plus 1 conditional on capital T. So that's the forecast error for our one step ahead forecast. That is going to be the realization at t plus 1 minus the estimate. For the time being we will abstract from having to estimate parameters. So instead of the hat coefficient matrices I will just use the the true coefficient matrices. So why capital T plus 1? Our process will tell us that this is the following and I'm just replicating our ARP process here. Okay, So that's going to be why capital T plus 1. So what about the forecast? So we have minus and now our forecast and we'll just take that green bit up here. Okay, That's what we use. Remember I will abstract from estimation issues for parameters. So that's all this. Okay, no error term of course. Now you can see all sorts of stuff is going to cancel out. All we are left with is epsilon t plus 1. So, and the expected value of that is of course 0. So the one step ahead forecast error is epsilon t plus 1. What about the two step ahead forecast error? So that's going to be y t plus 2, the realizations, minus the forecast always conditional on TL after conditioning uh, of here. So we'll do the same thing. I'll first replicate just the process equation again for the yt plus 2. Be careful that you have the right legs and the epsilon t plus 2 at the end and now minus our two step ahead forecast which we discussed up there. So I'll replicate that again neglecting the hats on the coefficient as discussed before. So now a number of terms will cancel out again the alpha, the second lag and the, up to the p lag, but we are left with that difference here because y hat t plus 1 is not the same as y t plus 1. So we are left with two terms plus epsilon t plus 2. I'll factor out the phi 1, so we get y t plus 1 minus y hat t plus 1, that of course is just our one step ahead forecast error. Okay, So that we calculated previously. So what we are left with is the two step ahead forecast error is phi 1 times epsilon t plus 1 plus epsilon t plus 2. Okay, Again the expectation of that is going to be zero. Now does that mean they are equally good, these two? Both have expectations of zero. The answer is no. The difference is in the variance. And it turns out that if you calculate the cross product of forecast error at t plus 1 with itself, remember that's going to be a 2 by 2 matrix, so that's a prime, so that's something like the variance of that forecast error, that's going to be smaller than the variance of the two step ahead forecast error but I leave that for yourself to figure out why that is the case. Both of these are going to be k by k beasts. Next we're going to talk about impulse response functions. For this we shall use the vector moving average representation of our process. So let's start by restating this vector moving average representation and we know that that's the same as the unconditional expectation of the process mu plus an infinite sum that goes from s equals to naught to infinity and then sums up past error terms epsilon t minus s times the coefficient vector where that first coefficient vector theta naught is the identity matrix. Now the parameter values in theta are themselves basically impossible to interpret. So what we do instead is we'll ask the question of how particular elements of yt, say the i-th element yit, respond to past shocks in the j element. So the shock to the j element would be epsilon jt. So formally we are asking for that, the partial derivative of yit with respect to epsilon jt minus s, and now that s could be naught, 1, 2, and so forth. Now it turns out the values for these partial derivatives are just the particular values of these coefficient matrices, um, so the i-j element of the s theta. If we then 
plot these elements for s equals naught to infinity basically we get impulse response function so we would get for s equals to zero we would get the immediate response of the i variable to a shock in the j variable so that's for s equals naught then we get the response to a shock one period before that would be at s equals one or two periods before and so forth and that tend to uh, fizzle out. Now in eViews when you create the plots the numbering is somewhat different. What is not here is 1 in eViews and so forth. Now an implicit assumption we make here is that we set a particular shock J S periods ago to 1 but all other shocks to all other elements at the same period at T minus S to 0 for all other elements. So we basically make them uncorrelated. However, we earlier said that we would allow contemporaneous correlation between the error terms. So somehow these two don't go together. Now we enforce a shock in one element only and everything else zero. But if there's correlation in the error terms, that's not a good representation of the real life shocks which we see in the epsilons. We need what is called an orthogonalized or structural var. Here is our var again in its AR representation. This vector of error terms, epsilon t, the elements in that can be correlated. This is represented by a variance covariance matrix for that epsilon t. We label that sigma. That has non-zero of diagonal elements, illustrating that there could be correlation. What we want to do is we want to create new error terms that are orthogonal. So we start out with our error term epsilon t and we shall pre-multiply it with a matrix C. Our result is a new vector ut. Now the dimensions are k by 1, k by 1 for the error terms and k by k for the C. And we want to achieve that the variance for that new error term ut, sigma u, is a diagonal matrix with variances on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. The question then arises what sort of C will achieve exactly that. There are several options. What we use is what's called the Holesky decomposition. And let's figure out what that C matrix looks like in that case. That C will be a matrix with values of 1 on the diagonal. So let's assume we have k equals 2. So that means we have a 2 by 2 matrix. So we will have on the diagonal values of 1s, a 0 on the upper triangle and, an, and some value little c on the lower of diagonal. Now it doesn't really matter what that value of c is exactly. Um, you, can, you can find out what that is. But what we'll do then is we take that c matrix and pre-multiply all the terms of our AR1 representation with that C. So here's our new model. So we have C times epsilon T. That of course that error term C times epsilon T is just our new error term UT. To get impulse response functions using this representation is means we need to transform our vector AR here represented in the asterisk equation to its vector moving average representation and then in that vector moving average we can easily read off the partial derivative of yit with respect to an error term j at time t minus s for s equals naught one two and so forth just as before but now with respect to the u's and these u's are now orthogonal so now it makes sense to say one u is one and all other u's are equal to zero because we've transformed to use which are orthogonal and correlated. There is of course a disadvantage with this approach. It is that this approach is what's called order dependent. Now what does that mean? It matters whether yt is defined as y1t and y2t or whether yt is defined as y2t and y1t. So the order of the individual elements that could be a GDP and interest depends. Let's just look at that term c times yt to illustrate that. c has the structure we discussed before. That's yt in the first ordering. And we can forget for the time being about the right-hand side. What we then get is 
especially the following. The first line is just 1 times y1t, the second line is c times y1t plus y2t. We can isolate the y1, y2 on the left hand side and then we get for the first line what we had before, but for the second line we get a negative c times y1t on the right hand side. Now that means that really y1t does not depend on y2t, but y2t does indeed depend on y1t because that's on the right hand side of the y2t um, equation. So what we used here was that first definition of yt, first y1 then y2t. If we use the other definition first y2t then y1t then you could go through the steps again but we would find that y1 would would depend on y2t but y2 would not depend on y1t so totally opposite implications.